Our Father in heaven, Lord, we're going to open your word and we want to hear your word. We want to hear you speak to each heart, to each mind. Help us each to hear what it is we need to hear today according to your will. Lord, I pray that you would speak to me and through me. But I also pray that if there's something somebody needs to hear that's different, that you would speak directly to them. Father, keep us from being distracted by things going on around us or the cares of this life. Help us to hear again you speaking to your church. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So I've been asked to uh, speak on peace. And um, that is, uh, I'm not sure if this is working. There we go. Um, the, the title of the sermon is The Peace Beyond, and it really relates to beyond understanding. Um, for those who are bottom line kind of thinkers, you want to hear the, the point before we get there. Uh, this is the point of the sermon. Uh, we can have peace beyond understanding, a peace which comes from a strong confidence in the justice and mercy of God through Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit. So if you have to get up and leave, you've heard the sermon, okay? <laughs> but I hope you don't leave. Uh, um, when I was younger, up until just a decade ago or so, uh, I had an Aunt Lottie. And uh, Aunt Lottie, I don't know if you say aunt or aunt or auntie, but in my house it was aunt. And uh, Aunt Lottie, uh, it's not a common name so much anymore. Um, my name wasn't so common back then either. Uh, the year I was born, my name was uh, didn't even make the top 400 uh, for boys' names. But then uh, in 1988, Justin all of a sudden was number seven for boys' names. So you probably all know somebody named Justin besides me. Um, but I didn't meet another Justin until I was 18. Um, my parents were ahead of the curve, and maybe your parents were the head, ahead of the curve with your name, too, if you're thinking it's a, an unusual name. Um, most of my interaction with Aunt Lottie was when I was a child. And uh, she was always kind to me. She was a safe person for me. When we would hug, I would squish and sink into her softness because she had a little bit extra, kind of like I do. And uh, I just loved Aunt Lottie, and she loved me. And that was a warm, safe place to be. Do you have somebody in your life that's like Aunt Lottie? Or was there somebody in your life like Aunt Lottie? I hope so. I think everybody should be so blessed to have an Aunt Lottie. Well, my Aunt Lottie sang in the church choir. And we've heard lots of beautiful music today. Uh, I could have just said, I'll skip the sermon, and some of you might think so too. <laughs> but uh, um, anyway, Aunt Lottie, one of my memories of Aunt Lottie was she came home, she came to our house, she stopped by on the way home. Uh, she had just come from church choir practice, and they were learning to sing a new response. Uh, and it was based on Numbers 6, uh, chapter 6, verses 24 to 26. And it's very similar to what's in our Adventist hymnal, the Seventh-day Adventist hymnal, number 669. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. Now, you've probably heard pastors pronounce that blessing at the end of a sermon, or perhaps you've heard it sung. Maybe you've sung it yourself as a, a responsive hymn. I'm not sure. But uh, this whole idea, there's nothing in this that we wouldn't want. Who doesn't want blessings and protection and grace and peace? We all want peace, right? Has the Lord given you peace? Are you thinking there will be no peace until Jesus comes the second time? Surely there will be peace then, right? I'm looking forward to that day. But the question remains, can there be peace on earth now, today, in our lives? Particularly at this time of year, there are choirs all over the world singing Handel's Messiah. 
Um, maybe a mass choir. Sometimes I hear on the radio, uh, there's going to be a mass choir bringing a certain copy of a certain text of uh, Handel's Messiah. And we're going to sing. Well, one of the verses that Handel used to make that masterpiece is Isaiah, whoops, Isaiah chapter 9, verse 6. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. And the government shall be upon his shoulder, and his name shall be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Now, isn't that a beautiful text with some unusual names? But uh, I, I look back as when I was younger and hadn't read the text, I'd only hear the music, and I always wondered about this guy named Khaled. And his name shall be Khaled. That's a weird name. <laughs> well, then once I read it, I could see it said called. Uh, but uh, wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting father, prince of peace. We all probably have heard of Prince. But do any of you know anybody named Prince of Peace? Other than Jesus? That's an unusual name. And then there's that angel choir. Uh, we've had lots of music today, as I said. Luke chapter 2, verse 14 tells us about the choir there over Bethlehem. And uh, I, I would love to have been able to sit there in that field and hear the song. But the angel's saying, glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. The angel choirs. And we sing, sing, choirs of angels. And I know one person said, uh, what's a sing choir? A sing choir of angels. I don't know what that is. <laughs> well, again, we have to read it to understand the angels are singing in a choir. But this peace, glory to God in the highest and on earth, peace, goodwill toward men. Can we experience peace on earth today? The Bible uses a number of words that get translated into English as peace. And I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this, but baraka usually is translated as blessing, but it could also be translated as peace. Yashar is more commonly translated as straight or right, but it can be translated as peace. The most common is shalom in Hebrew or irene in Greek, and these both have the meaning of wholeness, uh, completeness, peace, welfare, prosperity, tranquility, contentment, pretty diverse set of um, definitions. Our English definition, though, is generally absence of conflict or absence of war. And um, with that in mind, I'll go to uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 8, where the Bible says, there is a time for war and a time for peace. Well, if the angels are singing peace on earth, why is there ever a time for war? And that, that, kind of, that question has bothered me at times, uh, especially in my pre-Christian experience, even though I grew up in the church. Um, I... Uh, there was a time in my life where I didn't believe in God. And uh, this whole idea of peace was part of the conflict I had because I didn't see the peace. Anyway, um, Jesus also said in Matthew chapter 24, verse 6, that we would hear of wars and rumors of war. So that doesn't sound like peace on earth either. And yet I thought, that's why Jesus came. And then there's the human compromises of peace we see, where people just sort of shut their mouths because they don't want conflict, or they avoid people because they don't want conflict. And uh, they negotiate things because they don't want conflict. One of these compromises is told in uh, Joshua chapter 9, where the Hivites living among the Gibeons it, living in Gibeon at the time of the Israelite conquest, negotiated peace. How did they negotiate peace? They basically bought peace by committing to become slaves. 
They're going to cut the wood and they're going to haul the water for the Israelites. And that's how they would have peace. That's not the kind of peace I want. Is that the kind of peace you want? You can have peace if you're willing to be a slave. That, that just rubs against my American grain the wrong way. Uh, uh, live free or die, you know. Give me liberty or give me death. But slavery? I think we can do better than slavery. Unless it's slavery to God. In which case, we have a loving master. But let me go on. Matthew chapter 10, starting at verse 34, Jesus said, Think not that I am come to send peace on the earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. And I said, whoa, wait a minute. Wasn't he supposed to bring peace on earth? And then the same story in Luke, it says, Suppose ye that I am come to give peace on the earth? I tell you, nay, but rather division. So swords and division, is that what you want? That's not what I want. But it is what we want ultimately if we're following God. Let let me go on here. I'm not trying to paint Jesus in the wrong picture. Please do not misunderstand me. I am saying there's more in this book than what we sometimes appreciate. I believe that peace comes through relationship with God. Peace comes through relationship with God. And some of us might need to change our relationship status with God. In the Old Testament, peace offerings were multiplied. They would bring offerings for peace with God. And they'd bring them and bring them and bring them. And after a while, even the priests themselves didn't seem to appreciate the offerings. They were multiplied to the point of pointlessness until Jesus came. Jesus came and he made the most important peace offering. And we read about it in Colossians chapter 1 verse 20. And having made peace through the blood of his cross by him to reconcile all things unto himself by him, I say whether they be things in earth or things in heaven. The Apostle Paul says he made, Jesus came and made peace through the blood of his cross. The whole reason Jesus came was to reveal the character of the Father, to resolve the conflict between good and evil, and to deal with the problem of sin. And that means dealing with the sinner as well. And we are all sinners who've fallen short of the glory of God. But I'm going to go back now to the Old Testament. In Judges chapter 6, verse 24, we're looking at Gideon's altar, and it says, Then Gideon built an altar there unto the Lord, and called it Jehovah Shalom. In other words, God is peace. God, it doesn't say God gives peace. God is peace. That's awesome, Gideon. But what were you thinking in verse 13? And Gideon said unto him, O my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then is all this befallen us? Sounds a little doubtful, doesn't it? And where be all his miracles, which our fathers told us of, saying, Did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord has forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. Do you ever waver like this? Between the faithful statement and the statement of despair, faithful Gideon had this trouble. Are we better than Gideon? Do you ever waver and are you lacking the peace that Gideon was lacking? I want to encourage this congregation today. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus said, These things I have spoken unto you, That in me, that is, in Jesus, in Jesus, ye might have peace. In the world ye shall have tribulation, but be of good cheer, I have overcome the world. Because Jesus has overcome, we can overcome. Because Jesus has overcome, we have his righteousness. In In this statement, 
We have the source of peace. It's Jesus Christ. Is the statement still true when we face conflict? Yes, it is. Is the statement still true when we're in controversy? Yes, it is. When we're challenged, when we're in heartaches, when we have these crisis moments that make us want to throw up our hands and run, Jesus is still there. Jesus is still the answer. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, verse 15, the Bible says, This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am chief. The Apostle Paul thought he was the chief of sinners. I read it, I think I'm the chief of sinners. If you read it, I'm guessing you're thinking you're the chief of sinners because it applies to all of us. We have all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And yet God has given us a gift, a gift of Jesus Christ. And with this knowledge and experience, we shall have peace. Accept the incredible gift of God, the Christmas gift of Jesus as Savior and Lord. In Acts chapter 16, verse 31, the Bible says, actually Jesus said, excuse me, the Bible says, in regard to the uh, imprisonment here, the uh, warden of the prison and his family are wanting to know how to be saved. And the Apostle Paul says, And they said, Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved, and thy house. The followers of Jesus can have peace through Jesus Christ. The followers of Jesus can have peace by the power of the Holy Spirit. In Romans chapter 14, verse 17, the Bible says, For the kingdom of God is not meat and drink, but righteousness and peace and joy in the Holy Ghost. Do you want peace? Do you want joy? We sing about both of these things at Christmas time, right? Peace on earth and joy to the world. Where is it? It's right here in the Bible. And it's in the Holy Ghost working in our lives. The fruit of the Spirit this Holy Spirit that is spoken of so many times in the New Testament. The fruit of the Spirit is found in Galatians 5, verse 22 and verse 23. I didn't put that on there, but it's both verses. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such things there is, there is no law. Peace is right in the middle of that. Joy is in the middle of that too. But today we're talking about peace. It comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ, with God the Father, through his Holy Spirit. Philippians chapter 4, verse 7. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. This is the peace beyond understanding, the peace beyond that the sermon is actually about. We're talking about this peace that goes beyond human comprehension, the peace that's beyond wars and beyond rumors of wars, and beyond injustices and beyond oppression, sickness, sorrow, all sorts of challenges. This is peace that goes way beyond. And we can have this peace beyond understanding, a peace which comes from a strong confidence in the justice and mercy of God through Jesus Christ by his Holy Spirit, the whole Trinity. We can have peace. Now I've got a three-step sermon appeal. Every sermon should end with an appeal. That's what I was taught. Every sermon must end with an appeal. This one's easy. Will you accept Jesus as your personal savior from sin? That's why he came. Will you accept him as your personal savior from sin? Today we saw baptisms. We saw, I don't know if I should say a baptism with two people or we saw baptisms. But anyway, we saw it happen here. People giving their lives to Christ. People accepting the word and following through. Accept Jesus as your personal savior from sin. That's, a, that's the first step. The second step is to ask God to pour out his Holy Spirit upon you. He wants to fill you with his spirit, but he doesn't force his way. I believe that as we do this, the Holy Spirit will be active in our lives. 
The Holy Spirit will lead us to repentance. The Holy Spirit will lead us to obedience and to greater faith. The Holy Spirit will guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit will bring forth in our lives the fruit of the Spirit. And again, one aspect of that fruit is peace. And then the third step of my sermon appeal is, will you repeat steps one and two? It's like that old shampoo bottle saying, right? Repeat. I don't know what happens if we keep doing that. We'll run out of shampoo too fast. But uh, anyway, the sermon appeal is that we give our lives to Christ, accepting him as our personal savior, and then asking God to fill us with his Holy Spirit that we will have peace.